I've been able to and have had the honor to speak to quite a few um, club teams, high schools, Camps for Champs is the camps and clinics that I run with uh, fellow teammate uh, Kaylee Gilchrist. And so I've really had the opportunity to go out and be amongst our young athletes who are coming up in our sport, which is fantastic. Um, just last night I was speaking at uh, Kate School in Santa Barbara and speaking to all the female student athletes there. And um, one of the girls had said, you know, after John read that whole long list off, she goes, what was the, what are you most, what was your biggest accomplishment? What are you most proud of um, throughout your water polo career? And I paused for a second because I showed a little highlight video that basically was the same of the list that John just read off. And I said, obviously there's a lot to be proud of. There's some cool things that we accomplished as a team and as a group. Um, but the thing that I'm most proud of is the relationships that I built through my time on the national team and my time through the sport on the junior team, the youth team, through high school and club. The thing that I'm most proud about are the girls that continue to be my friend and I get to be um, kind of cruising through life with, not cruising through, we all know life isn't a cruise, but um, so that was my big, biggest accomplishment. Um, and so really to go back into our community and work with young athletes and share with them the things that I've learned throughout my 25 years of experience of playing team sport um, has been not only the most rewarding work that I've done since my retirement, but um, a privilege and in so much fun and watching the impact that it's making on young athletes has been incredibly rewarding. So. Really, today, um, for you, I hope to share a little bit of the voice of the athlete, um, things that I experienced that really helped me as an athlete, and things that I've experienced now working with young athletes coming up the uh, ages from 12 to 23 in our sport um, and other sports. I've um, shared just kind of the voice of that and the experience of that and how potentially you guys could use that um, to strengthen your athletes within your team. So I work for a company called Rise Athletes. Um, Rise Athletes was founded by two Olympic swimmers and they've built a community of 20 Olympians who are paired with young high school athletes, um, some collegiate athletes and even some young uh, elite athletes as well. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with over 30 athletes in eight different sports, rock climbing, ice hockey, some fun ones there, but at the end of the day, um, being an athlete is pretty much the same across the board. We're all striving to do the same thing with the same goals and challenged in the same ways, you know, managing fears and pressures and failures and things along those lines. So some of the areas that we focus on um, through RISE is adaptability, visualization, shifting language and self-talk, managing pressure, facing fear of failure, self-awareness, working on both strengths and weaknesses, and goal setting. Okay, so all of these things are probably things you're fairly familiar with. I wanted to start with focusing on coaching the inner athlete. It's kind of what I really focus on with the things that I do. Obviously, as an athlete, you're on the field, you're in the pool, there's X's and O's that you're dealing with, but there's a whole other element to how we can reach our athletes, and that's the inner athlete and the, the mental side of things. Through my time as an athlete, there are many of situations that I've gone through that have kind of allowed me to build some of my own best practices to get through challenging moments. So I went out and picked out the three best things that I could think of that were making the largest impact not only on my athletes, but the things that were most helpful for me as an athlete. I'll go ahead and show those with you. The first one was positive self-talk. This, I share the story of the first time that I made uh, my first world championship team. It was my second summer with the national team and we had been working our butts off all summer to make this team. And as you guys know, being on the national team, it's a consistent tryout. You're never comfortable. Every practice that you're at, you're working to make you know, get your position on the team. Every tournament that we go to is a tryout. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in a room and heard a list of names being read off and just hope that 
I did enough to make sure that I was on that list. Okay, so we had worked our way through the summer and here we were in that position where Guy Baker was the head coach at the time, was going to read off that list once again. And the name started rolling off and young, as I was younger in my career, I wasn't hearing anyone else's name, just praying that I could hear my own. So he starts rolling off and saying the names Patty, Mariah, Betsy, Jamie, and I hear Cammie. Okay, awesome. I just made my first world championship team. I was stoked. Then it kind of, sink, then it kind of started to sink in. I just made my first world championship team. Now I gotta go and I actually have to compete. It was in Melbourne, Australia, and we headed over about a week early so that we could you know, get acclimated, check out the venue, practice in the pool, and get situated. And when we got to the pool, everything seemed larger than life. They had all of the massive signage. There was a separate pool that was just for warm up, and then you walk down these super long hallways that had carpet in them down to the main venue, the main pool, and I was thinking, what am I doing here? Am I meant to be here? This is the biggest thing that I've ever been a part of. Only two years ago, I was swimming around Santa Barbara High School's pool, not even thinking that I could be at a tournament of this caliber. But I trained for this, and I'm in the position now to compete. World Championships is much like the Olympic structure, Olympic tournament structure, and we played six games every other day. So it's a 12-day tournament, essentially. That's a long period of time to be focused and have to maintain energy and you know, work through that tournament. It takes a lot of energy to get through that. We head to our first practice and we're in the, the main venue, which is an important, an important day because you want to see where the scoreboard is, where the shot clocks are, you want to get comfortable and kind of familiarize yourself with, with the area in which, or the pool that you're going to be playing in. And I remember thinking, I am so nervous, I'm having an outer body experience. This is like not even real. I can barely remember what you know we're supposed to be doing. And I'm sure if you turned and looked at me right in that moment and said, what's your name? I'd be like, I don't know, you tell me, you know? Because I was so, so nervous to be there. And again, a lot of that self doubt was coming into play of, you know, am I supposed to be here? Am I really ready for this? Will I, will I be good enough to play in this tournament? And I remember going home on the bus that night and thinking, there's no way that I'm going to make it through this tournament and maintain the right amount of energy worrying so much, having so much self-doubt, having so much fear. This is, I'm like literally plugging my energy into this tournament and giving it away, and we haven't even started. There's no way that I'm going to be able to do what I need to do in the pool and be this nervous. I need that energy to push a giant Australian girl around. Not to worry, right? So I went home that night and I opened up my journal and I wrote down five things. I wrote down, I'm strong, I'm explosive, I'm calm, I am smart, and I am ready. Okay, I didn't feel calm and I didn't feel ready, but I knew that's how I wanted to feel once the tournament had started. I'm strong, I'm smart, I'm explosive, I'm calm, I'm ready. And I wrote them down and I said them out loud to myself over and over again. I then ripped that piece of paper out of my journal and slipped it into my robe pocket because I knew I was gonna have my robe on as we entered the pool for announcements. We get to the pool for the first day of competition and as we go through dry land, I can feel my heart pumping again and those self-doubt thoughts coming in. And I started saying my I am statements over and over again. Got into the pool, did our warm up. Again, I'm explosive, I'm strong, I'm smart, I'm ready, I'm calm. Rubs go on, we head out to the pool to do announcements. At this point, I've had my hands slipped into my robe pocket and I'm just playing with the piece of paper as I'm saying it over and over again. So not only do I have the mental anchor and the verbal cues of my I am statements, but now I'm physically holding it and I'm rubbing it in my hand and it's keeping me in the moment. It's keeping me grounded and I'm not thinking, I'm not supposed to be here. I wonder how much the Australian girl lifts. Am I gonna be fast enough? How many goals is she gonna score on me? No, I'm, I'm empowering myself. I'm motivating myself. I'm keeping myself in the moment through these I am statements. Okay, and that's, to me, the power of self-talk. And for me, one of the biggest things that I teach to my youngest athletes is we have to be able to focus on things that keep us in the moment. And is it productive worry? or is it non-productive worry, right? Are we, are we focusing 
on the right things? Or are we focusing on things that are going to, in the end, not be helpful or serving to our performance in the, in the pool? So positive self-talk is a really important thing. And you know, I think back through my time as an athlete, and this is something that I kind of created on my own without even knowing that I was doing it, right? And I'm sure all of you guys have a moment throughout your careers where you had to have that internal pep talk with yourself when you're going in for an interview or taking a big exam or credential test or you know, your time as athletes as well where you've had to kind of lean in and say, all right, you got this, you got this. And so I am statements is just one thing that I've kind of created that is a, a framework or a guideline or exercise that you can use with your athletes. Um, but obviously not limited to that at all. I mean, I can't think about how many times I've jumped in the pool and feeling good, and in my mind I'm thinking, I'm feeling good. Ooh, you fast. Oh, you're moving good. You know, and how much are we cheering ourselves on through this, and how much, you know, are we helping ourselves through those hard times? And it's really important that we become the ones that can coach ourselves through those moments because we're not going to always have a teammate to lean on. We're not going to always have a coach to lean on. At times, it gets really lonely as an athlete, and you've got to be able to have these tools in place so that you can lean on yourself. Because there's gonna be times where you're annoying your teammates, and they're gonna roll their eyes at you, and it's gonna crush you. <laughs> and there's times that your coach is gonna yell at you, and you're gonna think, like, maybe I don't wanna come back. But at the end of the day, we have to learn how to lean on ourselves a bit. And so that positive self-talk is such an important part of that. Identifying strengths and weaknesses. So depending on your athlete or where they're at, if you ask them to go ahead and take a moment, take out a piece of paper and write down what their strengths and their weaknesses are, it could be incredibly easy for some athletes or it could be incredibly difficult for some athletes depending on where they're at. I have had athletes who can write a giant list of weaknesses and not one strength. And then I have the complete opposite. I'm awesome and I have no weaknesses. <laughs> or I have some that thought, you know, I haven't even thought about this. I think our sport is, you know, gives us a friendly reminder constantly of what our strengths and weaknesses are and can put you in your place and keep you humble. Um, but this to me is a really important exercise to do actually on a piece of paper in a journal. Write it down. What are the things that you have that you feel really solid in, that you feel really strong in? And you can start you know, just on offense, then on defense, then on six on five, five on six, then maybe as a teammate and as an individual. You know, what are things that you feel that you have your strengths in? You know, for me, I knew I had strong legs. You know, I had a, knew I had a strong snap to the ball. Um, I knew I could communicate well with different teammates on my teams. Um, I knew that those were my strengths, and I could own those. But I also knew what my weaknesses were. I wasn't good at remembering plays and all the little details. I really had to study hard on those things. I wasn't particularly strong at communicating in the moment in the water. Um, I like to rush through things, you know? I didn't want all these details at once. I wanted to just get out there and try it and go through it. These were things that were potential weaknesses, and we all know defense was a struggle. <laughs> and that was a weakness of mine. I think one of the really important things about identifying your weaknesses is creating a safe place where you can own those weaknesses as well. Once you can own them, then you're not hiding them. You're not ashamed of them. You're not trying to protect them with your ego or a mask. They're out there. I know they're my weaknesses. You know they're my weaknesses. Coach knows they're my weaknesses. And then now we actually have access to them to start working on them. I also found once I shared my weaknesses with my teammates rather than hiding it or protecting it, and let me tell you, we're in the like, most competitive in my environment, right? We're all competing for a, a place on this team. And sometimes that can feel like you're exposing yourself. I'm going to tell you my weaknesses, and now you're going to go get my spot on this team. But once I shared what my weaknesses were with my teammates, that changed the whole game for me. It took so much pressure off of me because all of a sudden, I'm supported. Because I promise you, for every weakness you have, 
you have a teammate who carries the strength to cover your back in that. I love sharing the story of uh, me and Annika Dries were training in the, two, uh, in the quad for the 2012 uh, London Olympic Games together. And Annika was your typical overthinker, and I am your typical non-thinker, okay? So we had the brains, and now she's off being a doctor, finding a cure for cancer. Um, so you could imagine how detail-oriented she was and how thoughtful she was with everything you're doing, what she was doing. And I was more of the player of like, yeah, you're gonna snap to the ball, and you're gonna do this, and you do that. I was more of like the feeling and going through the motion, and so we were just this little odd couple, but so, so, so important for each other. And Annika may be six years younger than me, and this is my second time around, and it's her first time. And I think two things that are really important here is, one, I didn't care where she was in the process. She was a young, a young one, and she looked up to me in certain ways, um, but I definitely looked up to her in a lot of ways. And she had that brilliant, brilliant brain, and I knew that she was looking at every single detail when it came down to learning plays. So I looked at her and I'm like, okay, you're 20, you're 21, I'm 25, I'm going to my second Olympics, but you know the plays. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna FaceTime you after we get our plays and our defenses and all that stuff. I'm gonna FaceTime you after practice and we're gonna go through each play together. And I, there was no ego in the way. I wasn't worried about her thinking I was dumb as an older veteran player. I wasn't worried about her thinking that I was incapable. I wasn't worried about losing respect from her. I just simply told her this isn't my strength and I need you to do this for me to make me the best that I can be. I need you to take your strength and help me with my weakness. And in that, you show vulnerability. Connection is, is created through that. Um, and trust is created through that. And a whole heck of a lot of respect is created through that. Um, and so again, if we, can, if we can pull back and simply just identify what our strengths and our weaknesses are and celebrate those with all the athletes that we have in our team, and I'm sure that they're supported by others in there. And we can have that kind of way of thinking rather than competing against each other, but competing alongside each other is super, super important. Mental preparation. Um, this, this brings up a really fun story for me. We were in uh, Kazan for World Championships in 2015. We had a lot of free time. There's not a lot you can do outside of the hotel in Russia. It's not the safest place. So we kind of were hanging out in the hotel quite a bit. And I was pretty nervous for this tournament. Um, I don't know why, but I was feeling that anxiousness and the nerves come in a little bit more than usual for this tournament. And I thought, okay, I have my process that I like to do from the moment I go to bed to the time that the whistle blows for the first sprint in our game. I know what my process is leading into a game and what really works well for me. And that's the whole mental side, right? We're not even talking about the physical warm up and being in the pool quite yet. Um, so I thought, all right, I'm a little bit nervous. Sometimes when I'm nervous, I can forget things quite quickly, you know, and I'm like, again, in that outer body experience place. So I thought what I'll do is go ahead and I'll write down everything that I do from the time that I go to bed to the time that that first whistle blows and the first, the balls drop for the first sprint. So I wrote it all down from the time, okay, you know, you go over the game plan the night before, you relax, get some sleep, you wake up the next morning, I eat a certain way, I look over the game plan a certain way, journal a certain way in a certain order, I start with offense and defense, six on five, five on six, all this preparation that goes into it, right? Maybe I'll take a nap if there's not enough time for a nap, maybe I'll get treatment. There's certain ways that I was going about doing things. Then you gotta make sure you have a coffee date, you're hanging out with your girls. What was really important to me is being loose and goofy and having some fun conversations before you got to the pool and got business mode. So I wrote down all of these things and even, <laughs> even as particular as into how I was packing my swim bag to get to the pool. Same order every single time so I wasn't forgetting things. I wrote all these things down and I took it to our sports psychologist and I said, hey, feeling really nervous about this tournament for whatever reason. There's just a lot of downtime and it's just sitting here and I really want to be able to um, be anchored by my preparation. And so what I did is I wrote down everything that I do from the night that I go to bed to the time that that first whistle blows. And I, I want to know if you could do like a voiceover of it. Can you do a voiceover it? And so that I can plug it in my ears and listen to it if I feel like I'm getting too far away from that. It can bring me back into the moment and get me back on track to where I needed to be.
Yeah, sure. What you may or may not know is our sports psychologist is a little Austrian man. So he has this very sweet little voice <laughs> with a great accent. And so it was suits, robe, caps, goggles, as he's going through the checklist of things, uh, which was, yeah, it was pretty funny. So I'm listening to him, like, okay, yeah, but, and I'm, you know, hey, girls, this is kind of cool. I did this, it's helping me, it's working for me. You listen to it, you know, and they're all giggling because it's suit, robe, cap, okay, great. Which became kind of, you know, it was cute. It was a joke between the girls and everything, and they're like, you were listening to Peter right now? You know, I'm like, no, I'm listening to rap at this point, you know, as we head to the pool. But um, it's part of that mental preparation, right? And again, like I had my anchors with my positive self-talk and my I am statements. I had my anchors with my mental preparation, how I was thinking, the things that I was going through. I had a checklist of things that I wanted to hit leading up to my game that I knew were gonna lead to success for me. And when those nerves start coming into play and that anxiousness comes into play when you're going into a big game, CIF game, league game, you know, NCAA game, national team game, whatever it may be, any of those levels, the nervousness is all the same, whether it's your first game or your last game of your career. And I found the way that I prepared mentally and the way that I anchored myself in my preparation and hit these things on the checklist kept me on track and allowed me to trust in the process that I was going through to reach success in being ready for that game. Water polo also is um, unique in the way that once you start playing, you kind of have to be in the moment. Otherwise, the game is moving on without you. So that's really nice. I only had to really worry about being in the moment and focusing on that preparation in the moment until that whistle blew. And then it was, all right, let's play. And everything just kind of dropped at the wayside. So how can we support our athletes? So those three things that we talked about before, coaching the inner athlete, I felt were three of the more important things that I've worked with my athletes um, on. I think fear of failure is a really big one. Um, managing pressure is another one. Um, and anxiety is, is another one that I hear over and over and over again. And how do we get these things to go away? Well, they're not gonna go away, it's how we manage them. So positive self-talk has become really important to teach to help manage pressure and to help manage fear and anxiety. Um, identifying strengths and weaknesses have been really important because it kind of takes that pressure off when you can have that full ownership of who you are. And then the last one is mental preparation, having confidence in your preparation so that you know you've done everything you possibly can to jump in that pool and just compete. So how can we support our athletes? Things that I felt are really important to give an athlete confidence going into practice and games is clarity of roles. How are you supposed to know what you're supposed to do if you don't know what you're supposed to do? <laughs> right? A lot of these girls, what position do you play? Well, I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Well, sometimes I'm this, sometimes I'm that. Well, maybe you're an all around. Is that your role? Maybe. So we need to be clear on what your role is and what is expected of you in that role. Clarity of standards and expectations. I think there, this has been really important to kind of develop cultures of team in, in my opinion. I think when you walk into a pool deck or you enter a team room, kind of what is the presence that we set? What are the expectations that we set for our athletes and how do we hold them to this? I think about working with young athletes and about myself as a young athlete and kind of the standards and expectations that I had for myself, but also how important it was to have that clarity from my coaches as well. So that there was no wiggle room in regards to, well, maybe I can mispractice because I have a lot of homework. No, we need to figure out how to time manage a little bit better so that we can do everything, right? Or showing up right on time versus showing up 15 minutes early. You know, all those little things, but that's what we have the power to teach and we have the power to set those right up front so that there's not a lot of wiggle room down the line. Open door policy, the power of communication. 
How many of us are mind readers? Yeah, right? So none of us are. So creating a safe place to have athletes be able to feel comfortable enough to approach you and have a conversation. Um, and also teaching self-advocacy. I think that's one thing that I focus on a lot. If something's not working for you, whether it's the way that you're receiving information or you're feeling you know, rushed going into a game or not fully supported in one way or the other, that we need to be able to advocate for ourselves and have a conversation with our coaches. For me, I, I have learning disabilities. I'm dyslexic and um, that has created a lot of challenges for me in the classroom. And at a young age, I had to learn how to be an advocate for myself. How do you approach a teacher and say, at seven years old, hi, I'm Cami Craig. I have dyslexia and ADD. I need extra time on test. I had all of this list of things that I needed to be successful in the classroom. And I was able to carry that over into the pool as well when it came time to talk to coaches. So if you're struggling you know, to reach, reach an athlete, is there a different way that we can kind of change things up? But I can remember vividly, um, having a conversation with Jovan, my college coach, and I was saying, you know, I'm having a really hard time when you start talking about all these plays and you're saying all these numbers and you're just pointing to really grasp what's going on here. And he's, okay, you know, okay, I hear you. And you never know how things get received by him, right? You know, and so the next day he comes rolling onto the pool deck with a whiteboard and I'm like, yes, he heard me. It worked. The, that door was open enough that I could get in there and feel confident enough to have that conversation and make some positive changes, not only for myself, but for sure it helped a lot more girls uh, in that pool than just me to have the plays and the practice written down on the whiteboard before we started that session. So creating a, a, a safe space to have um, an open door for your athletes to come in and communicate with you um, because it, it can be incredibly easy for some athletes, but really challenging for others. Power plays. So leading into these next few things, my power plays are um, things that I've learned throughout my career. Leadership. Identifying each individual's leadership styles. Okay, so I talked a little bit about strengths and weaknesses earlier on. Um, and I think that there's, there's a lot of that is connected to leadership. So when I think about leadership, I think about coming back from the 2008 Olympics. I was a junior at USC and I had just been given the position of captain. And I thought, okay, I'm a captain now. So I've got to do this. I've got to be really, you know, really serious. And I've got to be the voice in the water and I need to know every detail and I need to like have a stern face and be, you know, be, be the rock and act a certain way. Like to me, for whatever reason, this is what I have created in my mind as the ideal leader for a water polo team. This to me was the ideal leader. I need to know everything about water polo. I need to be super, you know, serious and, and set the tone in this way. And so this is how I was approaching every day of practice over and over again, trying to be tough, trying to hold these standards and expectations that I recreated for this perfect leader. And I totally lost myself in that process. I wasn't being my best self and I surely wasn't giving my best self to my girls through that, trying to be something that I completely was not. When I think about when I finally was given kind of the space and the opportunity to have ownership of my leadership style, um, that comes with a lot of smiling, a little bit of goofiness, some dancing, creating spaces that are really comfortable and relaxed for others, building relationships with my teammates, building relationships between other teammates and bringing them together and bringing a team together through kind of this lighthearted bubbliness. So here I was trying to operate as this ideal leader when really I needed to lean into my strengths and what I had to offer. So when I say identifying your strengths and weaknesses in the slides before, okay, what are your strengths? That's your natural leadership style. And don't worry about your weaknesses because somebody else's leadership style is gonna complement that and give you purpose in that team as well. So if you're the girl that sits on the bench, for the whole game, 
that's a form of leadership. You've got a role that you have to do sitting on that bench. There's girls who's come, who are getting pulled out of the game and maybe have one minute that they get to rest. And you have to be the one to give them that look in the face and say, all right, here we go. Clap, smile, be that energy when your girls are coming off out of the pool and onto the, onto the bench and have to go back in. That's a form of leadership. The girl that brings the energy in the weight room, I don't know how many of, or, or boys or girls teams that you guys have lifting, but any sort of dry land, the one that's bringing the energy there, the one that remembers all the details, that's a form of leadership. The one that always has snacks, that's a form of leadership. The one that's the last one in the pool, always cleaning up, but may not be the best player, is that's a form of leadership. Your top scorer, form of leadership. Your best defensive player. So how are we recognizing each athlete's leadership style? How are we celebrating that? How are we giving purpose to that? And how are we letting them to be their authentic selves every day at the pool through practice and competition? Because it's, it seems simple to me, when you feel the most comfortable in your own skin and you feel happy, you're going to produce better work. You're going to play better. You're going to feel better about yourself. You're going to have more confidence because you're celebrated for just simply being who you are. Team ownership. So once your athletes begin to kind of own who they are and understand who they are, um, then they start, well, this is also really funny. Can we take a second to look at this? Everyone's faces and Adams, we're pretty pumped up. I tried to crop him out of it, but for whatever reason, wasn't lining up right. I'm not a PowerPoint, you know, extraordinaire, but yeah, this is, I mean, who knows? Who knows? Okay. So um, once athletes start to identify kind of who they are and what they bring, what their purpose is, what their role is, and kind of their leadership style, um, they become, they, they start creating that ownership and then the team is kind of theirs for the taking, right? So giving space for athletes to feel that they have ownership of their team, that it's their team, that they feel like they are the steam behind the engine. I've had really, really amazing coaches throughout my career, but any time that we got to a place where we were able to own our own team was the most powerful place that we could be in. Because just like our athletes, we have strengths and weaknesses, so do our coaches. I know you're the example and you're supposed to be perfect, but you're not, none of us are. Obviously, you know, we wanna be perfect or as close to that as we can, but there's gonna be times where you make mistakes as a coach. And you're gonna want your team to be equipped with the confidence to carry you in those moments. And so giving space to allow your team to kind of take hold of it and have the confidence to have that ownership is really, really important. I think once your team starts to carry that ownership, then they start playing for each other as well. So I think about teams that I've been on where my teammate scores a really nasty shot, a real good shot, and you're like, yeah, you're pumped up on it. And the first place she turns around and looks is the pool deck at her coach for what, validation, confidence, I don't know. But where I want that teammate to look is right at me. I want that shot to go in, I want her to look at me and say, yeah, back to the lineup, right? So when I think about, like for me, that's like a, a really clear visual of who, who are you playing for on, you know, when you're in the pool and you're playing with your teammates, who are you playing for? Are you playing for the guy on the deck or are you playing for each other? And when you start playing for each other and you're feeling good in your own skin and you have that ownership of yourself and your team, it starts to get really, really fun as an athlete and you're learning to take on things on your own and, and with the girls or guys that you're, you're playing with. Permission to compete. To compete without fear of failure, to compete without fear of making a mistake, to compete freely and to get after it. Um, fear can be so paralyzing uh, to an athlete and their ability to take risk and take chances in the pool. Um, you know, I, I think about being an athlete, making a mistake, getting yelled at, making a mistake, getting pulled out making a mistake, 
you know, getting embarrassed, you know, and being made an example of. I think there's a fine balance to that. But permission to compete and have the ability to just make mistakes and have the ability to kind of work through those things and go through that learning on your own and not feel like you're going to be paused as soon as you start kind of going through that um, ex exploring phase of like, okay, how am I going to work through this? I'm going to make this mistake and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to try to make a, you know, less of a mistake and keep working through that. So permission to compete um, freely and without fear. But also, even from the athlete's perspective, there's so many times where I feel like, why are you grabbing my suit so much? Bro, calm down. What are you so like in my face about? Why are you like pushing me so hard, right? So this like, this kind of inner competition within, within your team and within your teammates. I mean, so many times, I've even heard athletes like, I, I realized I was deflating my teammate because I kept shutting her down, shutting her down, shutting her down. And I felt like I needed to take a step back. And so the mindset that I like to put in place in regards to that is if you, as a teammate, aren't bringing 110% to your teammate, that's not respect. You always want to show up giving 110% to your teammate because that's, that's as... That's respect, that's full respect, right? I mean, who feels good with saying, okay, go ahead, score a goal, go ahead. You know, no, you want someone to give you 100% every single time. And so I think a lot of times we think about, oh, she's in my suit, she's grabbing me, or he's like really getting physical with me. And there's this kind of immediate reaction of like, bro, calm down, or you know, and I think permission to compete and know that you have to give 110%, and that's full respect. And if anyone's giving you anything less than 110%, they're not respecting you as a player. So um, that is it. Those are some of kind of the best practices that I, I've pulled. I mean, there's a million more, but I feel like those have been some of the ones that have really s spoken directly to the athletes that I've been working with um, and I've seen over and over again. So hopefully that was helpful. And if you guys have any questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> yes. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Um, team ownership, you talked about um, like that eye contact you make with your teammates. Yeah. So coming from an athlete's view, like what does that look like for coaches? Like how can we help build that for you guys, the athletes? I think um, the moments of uh, allowing an athlete to kind of explore how you're going to get to that end result together. I have been in, on teams that have been very, very rigid, like you're going to do this, 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 and this. OK, go out, now go do this, 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 and this, right? And then I've had the coaches that have said, you guys got to figure it out. You got to find a solution to get through this, this play or this defensive, you know, with the framework of what you're teaching. So say it's a defense and you're like, this is the framework of it, but you need to figure out how you guys are gonna get through that together. You know, and if you're making uh, a mistake or making a poor call, then you gotta commit to that poor call and kind of work with it and all move together um, through that. And so I think like uh, allowing us to use our own minds to get through it and we're kind of having to do it together as a group um, allows to kind of build that, that ownership, right? Um, and, and creating space for us to motivate each other rather than fully just relying on a, on a coach to motivate us. I would say those are two really good ways to start creating that process. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I just had a question about um, sort of lower skill level teams and how you would approach introducing positive self-talk to players or even a whole team that really isn't very technically good and you yeah. want to be truthful with them and give them honest feedback but also be very clear about the fact that this is, they're not a bad person right. or bad at this sport because they're not um, following through on certain things right at that moment. Absolutely. So I think for lower level and maybe that are facing a lot of adversity, a lot of challenge, maybe repetitive losses, you know, a lot of failure is, first of all, they're learning way more about themselves when they're learning how to fail and come back again and fail and come back again. So 
they're learning more about their through their failures than they are their successes. So one, that's like the biggest thing. When you're succeeding, life is good, it's easy, it's easy to show up to practice, it's fun, it's all smiles. But when you're faced with failure over and over again, that's where you kind of have to dig in deep and your character starts to, to develop. And this is not gonna serve them only in sport, but in the classroom, in, jo in life, way after that. So I think identifying that and bringing that to the surface is super important. I know this is tough. I know this stinks a lot of the time because we're failing and having to come back over and over again, but you're able to learn more about yourself through this process than you ever would being able to win. For them individually, I would pick one thing for them to focus on for that game, whether it's I'm only gonna focus on hips up. I'm only gonna focus on keeping my head up in transition, right? We're talking about just the basic things that we want to pick out one specific thing for them to focus. And we want them to succeed that in that one specific thing through that game, right? And we don't want them to take on the whole, the whole game because it can be really overwhelming, right? And it's like, no, I, I just, I don't even want to do this. I don't even want to show up. So focus on one thing throughout that game. As a coach, make your goals for that game that are not related to the scoreboard, right? So as a team, these are realistic goals. I know where we're at. This is what we want to accomplish. So I think about, okay, the other side of that is we've played games where we've won like 20 to five, right? And we've been pulled out and there's disappointment. There's some leaning in by the coach because why? We didn't meet our goals and our standards. So it doesn't matter what the scoreboard is saying. It's not important. What are we, how are we managing and how are we getting to the goals that we want to reach? So one, are you reaching your, your own focus, your own goal for the game? Just one thing. And if you are, celebrate it. If you score one goal and they have 20 against you, celebrate it. These are your small successes. Okay, so are you reaching your, your goals as a team? Are you reaching your goals um, as an individual and knowing that there's so much that comes from consistent you know, challenge and adversity? I was thinking about, you know, it's, we have this special time when like we're focused on the sport and that's it, but then there's this real life component. Mm -hmm. For a full-time athlete, I mean, that all seems, feels very blended that that is your real life. <coughs> what about with our younger athletes when that home life, how do you balance, how do you help them balance that when the home life is rushing into their play life? Sure. Yeah, and I think when you think about all, I mean, man, I don't know. I would never want to be a high schooler. All the things that they have going on and all the moving pieces. So I think really where we can help is time management, okay? Like that's a resource that we can help kids with outside of water polo and how are we balancing all of our time so we don't feel like the weight of the world is on our shoulders. Um, but I also think there's something really special about being a part of a sports team and playing our sport. When you walk into, onto a pool deck or you walk through those doors, you're like transported. And this is a place where you can go in and just play and just be and only think about water polo. I can't tell you how many times I've had teammates going through, you know, challenging things, whether it be family, boyfriends, girl, whatever it may be, right? And when you come into the pool deck, you're supported by a team where you can be yourself. You're supported by a coach that you can talk to, and then you can just go in and play the sport that you love. So how is this something that is an outlet for your athletes rather than a burden, right? And creating a safe place for them to get lost in it. Some of mine plays on theirs. It's how do you deal with parents who are telling your kids something different, like either you're in the I am this, I am positive, but you have a parent, you're not doing this, and she got a better goal, or you know, that kind of, how do you balance that? I mean, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that, that to me, I don't have a, a, a specific answer to, but I think, you know, what I try to do is give my athletes all the tools that they can to build themselves up, right? And advocate for themselves, you know? If it's a hard conversation you need to have with mom and dad, you know, empowering them to have that conversation because again, mom and dad aren't mind readers and they don't under, you know, they don't know it. They don't know maybe all the things that you're feeling, you know?
Um, I've, I've had some conversations with parents, but yeah, typically the focus is mainly on the athlete and how to help and support them through that. Do you have any tricks for the athlete that's really, really good, not a really great person? So she or he may bring down their team, but they are by far the best kid in the pool? I think just sharing mindset and the importance of team. I'm like the biggest team advocate, right? And the importance of that. So, you know, I think for me, it's, it's based off the athlete's experience of what they are sharing with me. Um, but for me, it's just continuously and kindly reminding them the power of the team and passes are coming to you through your team. And we need to bring, we need to bring everyone up with us, not leave them behind, you know? So I would, yeah, that would be what I would share. So as, a, as an athlete going through, some would call it boring, but we like to call them fun fundamentals, like for the yes. team, right? I know AK is big on it. So like, how did you, who are not big on the details, but yeah. have fun, how did you get through those 30, 40 minute things? Yeah. I'm sure, obviously you had some success, <laughs> so it might have been easier after having success, but how do you, how do you keep doing those same things over and over again? Right. So I, through camps, it's funny because we do all the same fundamentals that we do with the national team with all of our younger kids. And it's like, oh, we have to do this lap twice. I'm like, oh my gosh, you're tired after two laps. I've been doing it for 13 years, you know? <laughs> I'm like, come on. So finding competition within that movement or that drill or that fundamental, right? So I'm doing like over my hips, over and over and over again. But how do I become a little tighter? How do I become a little quicker and have fun with that and kind of compete within that movement? And mo for the most part, all athletes are looking to compete. So how do you make that more fun and compete within that? I have a few athletes who um, mentally shut down pretty quickly. And I've gone through the positive self-talk, things like that. How can I support them more? Because when I keep them in, it just keeps deteriorating. So I, I pull them out and I try to have a conversation. What can I say to them? Right. I think for me as an athlete, when I was in those positions where I'm feeling like I'm shutting down or seeing teammates who are shutting down, one, talking to them away from the game, okay? So like you're in it, you're feeling dragged down or you're feeling really frustrated. It's really hard to get anything beneficial out of that right in that moment, right? It's kind of like you're trying to do a quick fix, but maybe move away from that and have a conversation of like, hey, what's triggering this? What, where is this coming from, you know, and, and kind of work from that and maybe they'll have an open honest conversation with you in, in that light and then um, for me I wanted to put things in place that if I started feeling that negativity come on you know that positive self-talk would kick in so like oh I'm starting to feel like it, this is starting to shift that frustrations coming in how do I start to manage that or shut that down before it takes a hold of me and again like it takes time to build up strength in movements that you're doing and fundamentals that you're doing it's not going to be a quick fix in fixing mental positivity right it takes repetition and reminding and to go through those experiences over and over again to get to a place where you're fine-tuning it or getting better at it um, yeah yeah <laughs> I'm like do I have one more thing to add about that no yeah uh, so after such a long career, what has, what has encouraged you or why do you uh, stay so close to the sport and want to mentor, maybe you covered this at the beginning, but why are you doing these programs now? Yeah, I think for me, connection and instilling belief in others is everything, right? And I've had some heroes in my life that have kind of pushed me along this journey that made a huge difference. And it wasn't, you know, it was one moment where they said one thing that kind of shifted or kept me moving in one direction or another. You know, I grew up, my parents, neither of them are athletes. My mom doesn't know how to swim. If she fell in a pool today, we'd have to save her. And um, I'm the first in my family to attend and graduate college. So no athletic background, no educational background. We literally were just kind of going through this whole thing together. Um, and so 
there's so much that we could have probably benefited from if we knew one way or the other. Like I remember like my mom being like, you could actually go to college and play water polo. And I'm like, what? And she's like, yeah. You know, or that moment was like, you potentially could, you know, be asked to try out for the national team. And we're like, what? You know, so there was no like plan in place. But I also know that there was quite a bit of learning through that. And if I can make that a little bit smoother for any athlete that I'm working with um, and really just give them the confidence to do it, that's, that's to me a great success. And I think about areas where I was so lacking so much confidence and I wonder how much I could have gotten out of it um, if I had a little bit more confidence and if I can put that into any of the athletes that I'm working with, it's a success. When I, when I point you out, <coughs> my girls, they have no idea <laughs> that you are insecure and on any level, at any point, any time. Yeah. So just go, give me a break. She's a pro. You're asking me to attain too high a level. And it's, it's interesting to drill down through that and try and convince that player that no, everybody has these doubts. You know? yeah. So do you have any tricks for how you convince 14, 15 year old girls that they're <coughs> They're really not in a different place. I don't know when she was yeah. growing up. Hey, Dad, it's different. Yeah. When you yeah. were in school, it was different, you know, and of course it wasn't. But, yeah. But do you have any tricks on what you do with that freshman, sophomore group that you're trying to, so that they don't kill themselves emotionally? Yeah. Working out. And so it's like, I mean, you call it a trick or, I mean, give them the opportunity to identify what their strengths and weaknesses are, you know? And also comparison is a huge thing for that high school age, comparing yourself and they have social media and all this stuff going on. So uh, one of the things that I also like to work on is what's within your control and what's outside of your control, right? So let's write down a list of things that are within your control, okay? I can control how much I sleep, what I eat, um, if I choose to be on social media all day, um, how I prepare, my attitude, um, potentially, you know, how I'm managing fear. Um, I can control, you know, how I'm managing my time. Okay, these are the things that are within your control. Okay, what's outside of your control? Whether this girl likes me or not, whether my coach is going to yell at me or not, whether my teacher is going to assign me all this homework. These are all things that are outside of my control. Okay, so here's this list of things that you can control and a list of things that are outside of your control. Okay, how much time, energy, and focus are we giving to things that are outside of our control? And no matter how much we will or try to change them, with our mental power and our worry and our anxiety and our stress, are we able to change them? We just aren't. So be aware of that and challenge your athletes, as I challenge myself, am I losing too much energy that I need for myself on this? Something that's totally out of my control? And if so, how do I bring it back to myself? What do I need to focus on? If I'm like super concerned or really nervous about this test coming, coming up, okay, well then the control is I wanna get a good night's sleep before. I want to focus on how I'm studying and how I'm preparing for that. It's the same thing as going into a big game. My, my preparation leading up to the game is what gives me the confidence to go out and play the game. So how are we kind of taking control of the things that we can control and letting the things that we can't not affect us? Your comment how you were continually or constantly competing for your position. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking after a while, don't, didn't you feel pretty comfortable? Like, okay, I've got this. No. There was always somebody <laughs> ready to displace you. Um, it wasn't about somebody. I think it was just the standards and expectations that I held for myself that kept it, kept me feeling kind of like always in that continuous tryout. Um, and I've always felt the second that you relax, like you, you give space for somebody to come in and take it. So if you were sick, I could probably count on one hand how many times I missed practice for illness or sickness or you know injury because it's just you you were there because every moment that you weren't in the pool someone was getting that much better than you or had an opportunity to take your place and so that's pretty motivating in itself with that being said you kind of keep this like c consistent pressure on yourself to compete for this spot but also you're having to create bonds and with the girls that you're competing with so 
not getting so wrapped up in their journey or what they're doing and how they're doing, you know, but really focusing on yourself so that I'm not sitting here going like, oh, she got two minutes more playing time than me. No, I'm thinking about, okay, when I get in for those two minutes, what am I going to do with those two minutes? How am I going to be successful? How am I going to get that ball into the back of the cage? Or, um, you know, she's starting and I'm not, okay? That's out of my control. I don't need to worry about that. I'm not starting, but now I get to watch what everyone's doing. And when I get in, what am I going to do with that? Right? So putting things back into that place where you're focusing on you and never getting too comfortable. Don't ever get too comfortable. <laughs> Kind of in that vein, I was just, I kind of noticed that one of the biggest barriers to um, self believing in yourself is kind of being uncomfortable with being uncomfortable yeah. and being afraid. And I was wondering how you might, if you had any advice about how to go about communicating to um, 14, 15, 16 year olds that it, it's okay to feel uncomfortable yeah. and you can ride that out. Yeah, well, I think that's a beautiful way to say it right there. I, you know, like that's, I, and that's really the truth. It's that you can't, you're going to be nervous. You're going to have those feelings. No matter how much I've tried, there's not a switch that you can turn off nerves or nervousness. It's how you kind of create your own tools and ways to work through it, you know? And I have things that have worked for me as an athlete, which I try to share with other athletes. And then also kind of go through that brainstorming and have them kind of create, like, okay, when I'm nervous, when I like listen to Rihanna, it helps. I like can, you know, <laughs> put it in a different, you know, energy, you know, and it's little things like that, as silly as it sounds. It was holding a piece of paper in my hand at 20 or at 19 at World Championships that helped that, you know. So it's little things and little anchors like that to help ride the wave and that it's not going to go away, but it's knowing that it's going to show up. And it's like, hello, I expected you and I'm prepared for you like I'm prepared for this opponent. Yeah. I think you did a phenomenal job. It's like attending a TED Talk. Oh, thanks, Janai. <laughs> uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to congratulate you for uh, surviving uh, Johan and you. <laughs> uh, even uh, knowing that you had the dyslexia. Yeah. Learning all, all these plays and next oh, yeah. doing exactly what he wants all the time. Not just, uh, you know, in particular games, but all the time, even in practice. Um, and then going to uh, uh, Adam's team and playing for Adam and completely different, like 180 degrees uh, opposite. Yeah. So which uh, environment uh, uh, worked better for you? Um, well, as an athlete going through all those... Both of them yeah, successful. right. Um, again, like I said, I'm really fortunate to have played for some of the best coaches and learning such great things from each of them. I think about my time with Jovan and how much, I mean, he, I learned a lot about water polo, but I also learned a lot about outside of water polo. So Jovan was very much a, a coach that, you know, you need to sleep well, you need to eat well, you need to recover well, you need to think about how you're engaging with your teammates, you need to um, think about how you're setting up your time so that you can give all of your energy to each thing. And so it wasn't just simply about X's and O's and his thick manual of, <laughs> of water polo, but it was really like, I'm expecting the whole, the whole, the whole thing from you, right? And, and so for me, being exposed to that made it really nice and easy to roll into the national team because I got to be exposed to that through the college level. Guy Baker was so fundamentally sound everything was black and white and there was an answer for every issue or problem, you know? And for me, that was like, I locked into being super fundamentally sound. Everything was kind of step by step by step. It was really clear. It was very simple to me, you know? It wasn't super complex. And so I learned really the foundation of water polo through that. And then Adam allowing us to be creative. So take those foundations that you learned and take that whole body athlete that you have learned to be through these you know, other two coaches and now go out and play and explore and take ownership of who you are as an athlete and go compete. And so I, I feel really, really fortunate to have taken such great elements from every coach and having it kind of in the order that I did because it worked out super well. And as an athlete, you know, having figuring out how to be the best athlete in each environment um, was my job, right? Just to keep progressing.
Would you say your competitiveness was like innate, or was it learned, or was there a certain time in your childhood that all of a sudden, I'm gonna beat everybody around me, I'm gonna be better than I was yesterday? It's really, it, like obviously I'm competitive, right? Like we all are in a certain way, but I think for me, Man, I was just having so much fun with what I was doing, and I, I think half of it was like I was blessed because I was born with this body and <laughs> really enjoyed the, the pool, and um, learning wasn't easy for me in the classroom, and so every time I learned something new in the pool, it was like, yeah, I'm coming back for more. Yeah, I'm coming back for more, you know? And I think uh, it, was, it was never like I have to be the best. I never felt a pressure to be the best, but I just enjoyed being up there and doing the best that I could. Um, so I don't know. It's like I, when people are like, how competitive are you? I'm like, I don't know. Like, I mean, obviously enough to get up every day and like get after it, but I was really there to like enjoy hanging out with my friends and like playing the sport I love and being in the water. So I feel really lucky for, for that. And obviously I wanted to be the one doing the pushing around, not someone pushing me around. So. <laughs>